This is our 60th anniversary year, and I like to take uh, at least some of our lectures and speakers and explain how they relate to the history of this organization. Uh, we began this series last month with a lecture by Ron Granieri on what is geopolitics and why does it matter, because uh, FPRI's method has been the geopolitical perspective that our founder, strauss -Upe, embedded in it uh, in 1955. Uh, the unfortunate, Ron did a great job explaining even the thinking of Robert strauss -Upe, but it occurred to me he never actually met strauss -Upe. Well, tonight's speaker uh, did get to know strauss -Upe pretty well, I think, in the years. Adam was uh, an undergraduate of Penn, and it was right after he graduated from Penn that he got his start at FPRI. And that's the other theme I like to bring to light, is that a lot of the leading thinkers and practitioners of foreign policy today actually got their start at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Adam worked here for many years and then went on to uh, serve on the U.S. National Security Commission in the, t for the 21st century. I believe they issued their first report in uh, April 2001, where they started talking about the need to strengthen our homeland security. That was a term that was not used in April 2001. It only became useful in September 2001. Uh, Adam went on to serve as editor of the National Interest Magazine and is now the editor of the American Interest Magazine, two very important magazines in the larger foreign policy discourse. And in between, he served as a speechwriter for uh, uh, Colin Powell, Secretary of State Colin Powell and then for Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. We've asked him uh, to, to take up the theme of geopolitics uh, dealing with the Middle East. Next month, we'll be looking at the geopolitics of Europe and then the following month, the geopolitics of East Asia. But uh, there's a lot going around in the Middle East, if you haven't noticed. And it's actually very hard to tell who's supposed to be on whose side, uh, but there's nobody really better to explain kind of the chessboard that makes up the Middle East than uh, my old friend and colleague, Adam Garfinkel. So please welcome Adam Garfinkel. Hello, everybody. I see a, several familiar faces, including some who've already heard this talk or part of this talk before, which I regret, but uh, can't do much about. Alan asked me if I would uh, say a word or two about Robert strauss Upe, and I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, but before that, uh, it's obviously St. Patrick's Day. There's a little green in my tie here. You know? And I thought uh, it was obligatory to tell an Irish joke. Now, most Irish jokes are made up by English people, and they're not very nice. They're kind of the equivalent of an American Pollock joke. So I won't tell one of those, but there's another joke I know that's not like that, and I rather like it because it, um, it, uh, it features a dimension of th this civilization which is quite dear to my heart and I'm sure dear to many of your hearts. So the story is told about a fellow named Patty who doesn't have a job. And so he tries to get a job doing construction, and he persuades the foreman to let him have a job. So he goes down in the pit, and he's working down there for an hour or so, and the foreman is watching him. And the foreman sees that he doesn't know a damn thing about construction. So he goes down there after about an hour, and he says, Patty, what the hell is the matter with you? You don't know what you're doing. You don't know the difference between a Goethe and a Joist. And Patty says, oh, but sure I do. Goethe wrote Faustus, but Joist wrote Ulysses. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I'll drink to that. <laughs> it's not green water, but it's water. Anyway, Robert strauss Upe was one of the sev several mentors of mine at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and of course at Penn as well over the years. And just kind of coincidentally, in today's New York Times, a column by David Brooks called Skills in Flux really captures what was so special, not just about Robert strauss Upe, but about um, many of the mentors that I was privileged to, um, to get to know and learn from uh, at FPRI and at Penn. And so I'd like to just read uh, part of the column Sorry if this is repetitious for some of you. And it's right on the crease, wouldn't you know it? Uh, he's talking about skills that reverberate with the times that we live in. Skill sets are changing because the world and technology is changing. And this is what David Brooks has to say. People who can capture, come on, crease, 
Amorphous trends with a clarifying label have enormous worth. Karl Popper observed that there are clock problems and cloud problems. Clock problems can be divided into parts, but cloud problems are invisible emergent systems. A culture problem is a cloud. So is a personality, an era, and a social environment. Since it is easier to think deductively, most people try to turn cloud problems into clock problems, but a few people are able to, to look at a complex situation, this is the important part, grasp the gist and clarify it by naming what is going on. Such people tend to possess what he calls negative capacity, the ability to live with ambiguity and not leap to premature conclusions. They can absorb a stream of disparate data and rest in it until they can synthesize it into one trend, pattern, or generalization. Such people can create a mental model that helps them think about a phenomenon. As Oswell Chambers put it, and here's David quoting someone else, which is very generous, the author who benefits you most, or the speaker who benefits you most, right, is not someone who tells you something you didn't know before, but the one who gives expression to the truth that has been dumbly struggling in you for utterance. That, that's the kind of person that Robert Strauss Hupe was. He had this ability to get his arms around vast and disparate data, synthesize it, and name it in a way that made it intelligible. That's what he could do. Uh, it's a rare skill. It's something that other mentors of mine have, uh, have demonstrated before me. It's something that I've tried to emulate and learn myself with, I have to say, very mixed success. Uh, but I, but I, I still try. You know, one does one's best, right? Uh, so um, let me tell you a story briefly about Robert Strauss Hupe. The FPR, I had a party for him on a birthday. I think it was a 95th birthday or, no, I don't it was it was up there. It was, a, it was an advanced birthday. So I remember this, uh, this young woman uh, holding a glass of champagne or something and coming up to Ambassador Strauss Hupe and saying, oh, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, to what quality do you owe your long life? And uh, he had, used to smoke these little brown cigarillos, you know. They, were, they it smelled like a small burning garbage dump to me, but he loved them. <clears throat> and he said, my dear, I owe my long life to the fact that I have not yet died. <laughs> that was pretty good, but then about 15 minutes later, another, another, young, another young person came up to him and said, um, Mr. Ambassador, can I ask you a question? He said, certainly. He said, it's not easy growing old. That's, that's clear. Is there anything about growing old that is uh, particularly enjoyable? And without missing a beat, Strauss Huppé said, yes, one's enemies tend to fall silent. <laughs> 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 so he, he was a remarkable fellow, and uh, I learned a great deal from him. Um, uh, uh, if he were alive today, he'd be, I don't know, 120? I don't know what he'd be. But he's not, so I have to try to do what he might have done in a similar circumstance. Um, the geopolitics theme is, of course, very important. Knowing where things are, uh, knowing where water is, knowing where mountains, is, all that kind of stuff is very important. Uh, but not everything about the world turns on geopolitics, and so I hope I don't disappoint you by saying that there is a geopolitical dimension to what's going on in the Middle East today. It has two variants. There is a geopolitical reality to what is going on inside the region, all right, uh, which is shrouded by a series of other complicating variables. For example, uh, religious sectarian division, ethno-linguistic cleavages and division, a historical baggage that goes back many millennia. So it's not just about power vectors and where the armies are and where the oil is and where the money is. Even within geopolitics, in a kind of a, a, you know, a simplified way, there is a whole, there's a whole array of variables that, that interact uh, within a, a geophysical um, environment or, or, or a framework. But then in addition to the geopolitics within the region, there's a geopolitics of the region. In other words, what, how does, how does uh, the Middle East look, geopolitically speaking, from what's the view from home? How does the United States uh, government look at um, the relative importance of the Middle East? What kinds of um, problems and opportunities are there in the Middle East as, and how does it interact with Europe and the Far East and other parts of the world? So these are the two dimensions of geopolitics that come into play, and I will return to some of this in a minute, but I have to say that 
what is really happening in the region right now um, <clears throat> is not so much about geopolitics. Geopolitics is sort of epiphenomenal right now. It's a second order series of uh, of considerations. What's really going on in the region is a little deeper than that. And the reason is because when you take the, geo the geopolitical frame, at least when you take it the way that it's normally understood, the way that most people uh, think about it and talk about it, there's a presumption of state actors. They may be nation states, they may be empires, they may be any sort of uh, uh, confabulation of executive power, but the assumption is that there are governments and these governments have executive agency and they can make decisions and that more often than not they control what goes on uh, in their territory because we're talking about Westphalian units, the territorial state, right? But what is really important about the Middle East today and what is most characteristic of it is its statelessness or let's put it this way, that's a little bit uh, excessive, is its, um, its proliferation of failing and failed states. The Westphalian units that we took for granted most of our lives and into the Cold War and so on, uh, those units are now under great pressure. Uh, the state is under pressure and, and uh, a lot of tension the world over. It's not just in the Middle East or in, in West Africa. And we'll come back to that in a minute as to why that is. But where states have been most fragile, where they have, where they have comported less well with the social structure and cultural predicates of the societies, they have, tend to, they, have, they have tended to be most fragile, least successful units of political organization, mobilization, and, and success. So we're seeing now uh, this phenomenon in the Middle East. A lot of people have taken the geopolitical frame, for example, and they've said, oh, look, what's really happening is that the Sykes-Picot system uh, created after the First World War with the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire is crumbling. Well, sure it is, but it's crumbling because the state units themselves are either crumbling or, or are in danger of crumbling. Uh, there are now four Arab countries that for all practical purposes don't exist anymore as states. Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya. <clears throat> and this has all happened within the course of a couple of years. Uh, I, and it's very important to keep the vocabulary straight. When I say that uh, these countries no longer, these, these states no longer, I don't mean the countries don't, don't, of course the countries exist. The same sandstone rocks are there. You know, a country is a place. I, I have to do this because I find that a lot of students, but I find that a lot of older Americans too, don't have the vocabulary right to think seriously about these subjects. A, a lot of Americans think that the word country, the word nation, the word state, and the word nation state are all synonyms. But they're not. If you just look at a dictionary carefully, you'll see that they're different things. A country is a place. The Westphalian state has territorial designations. That's a place. A nation is a group of people who uh, think they have enough in common to get away with um, uh, calling themselves a nation. That's Hans Kohn's famous definition of a nation. I had a student some years ago, who didn't understand these, this vocabulary distinction very well, came to me uh, after class, very enthusiastic, and he said, oh, professor, professor, I had a terrific summer. I drove clear across the nation and back. I said, you've just confessed to multiple vehicular homicide. <laughs> He had no idea what I was talking about. <clears throat> a state is a governmental apparatus that rules the nation in the country. A nation state is a normative term, dates from the 19th century, which basically says that the state and the nation, the ethno-linguistic uh, majority, should be isomorphic. So that, for example, uh, German speakers should not be ruling Czechs, Czechs should be ruling Czechs. Russians should not be ruling Finns, Finns should be ruling, and that's, that's what these words mean, all right? And the way a lot of people throw these things around like they're synonyms drives me nuts. So it's the state that's collapsing in a lot of the Arab world, not the nation. What's the, what, what, what are we talking about? What nation are we talking about? That's an interesting subject in, in, in itself. And of course, the country's still there. Uh, as for nation state, that, that, that term actually never applied very well uh, to most of the Arab countries because the Arabs think of themselves as a single nation, divided into 22 or 23 parts, depending on how you, how you think about it. So this Western grid, uh, that, that arose organically from Western history into the early modern period where Britain and France and the Netherlands and Spain all sort of become modern states as we understand it. And as Max Weber explained to us uh, uh, years ago, of course he's not been around for a while, that you know, a state, a modern state, has um, a bureaucracy, it has routinized authority, it no longer relies on charisma, it has moved beyond the patrimonial state where tribes or clans or individuals more or less essentially owned 
the country, and it has now branched out and has become modern. And uh, this, of course, is all dovetailed with the, the, the development of modern, modern capital. So it's, I'm not going to give you a, you know, a deep history lesson. But Middle Eastern states did not go through this organic experience. The, the, the basic um, uh, units of coherence, of social coherence and authority, in most of this part of the world depended on tribe and sect and locality. And so for, uh, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed in World War I, for Britain and France uh, mainly, to come and superimpose this Westphalian grid on top of this, this region, uh, uh, of course it worked. I mean, you saw they had constitutions, they had presidents and prime ministers and parliaments and so forth and so on, but it never really uh, uh, fit very well uh, with, the, with the precursor social structure and culture. Those are two different things to an anthropologist, by the way. Um, some of them work better than others. In place, there was, there was a sense of stateness in some of the countries of the Middle East. Egypt is a good example. Um, uh, Mesopotamia, Iraq, in a sense, was, though not in the shape that the British created it in 1920. Uh, so when, when the pressures, the modern pressures on the state began to rattle all states, the weakest ones have begun to collapse first. And uh, to be specific, let's talk about some of these countries. And then we'll get around to, to uh, uh, things like what people call the Islamic State or ISIS or Daesh in the uh, Arabic acronym. You can pick your own name. I don't really care. Um, <clears throat> uh, the United States uh, is responsible in part or in whole or in large part for several of these disintegrated states. Not that they wouldn't have fallen apart on their own eventually. They were pretty much aging regimes and, and uh, uh, strained circumstances anyhow. But to see how this plays into uh, what you see in the newspaper in the morning and into geopolitics, let's take Iraq. Iraq under Saddam Hussein, under the Ba'ath Party, from 1968 on, was, let's face it, a nasty place. Uh, it was a menace to most of its neighbors, Kuwait being a case in point, Iran being another case in point, and, event, and the Kurds inside the country. Uh, uh, the Anfal campaign, you probably remember, uh, some of you remember that from the late 80s. Uh, a nasty, a nasty uh, regime, and seemed to be, Iraq seemed to be, a sort of modern, modernistic or modern, progressive, quote unquote, kind of socialist country. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein and most of the people back, most of his uh, um, associates back in the day, they didn't walk, they didn't walk around in dishtashos, they didn't walk around in, you know, robes and white kafia. They walked around looking like any, any Westerner would, would, uh, would dress. So you figure, well, this is, this is a modernizing or a progressive kind of regime. And in Egypt, they did the same thing. And in Syria, they did the same thing in other places. You know. uh, but the truth of the matter was is that the, the facade of, of these modern institutions never penetrated very far into Iraqi society. And so when the United States came along, uh, whether for good or bad reason, we can, we can talk about for weeks, you know, uh, and basically took a little, a little ball-peen hammer and tapped the crystalline structure that was the fragile edifice of the Iraqi state, it shattered into a million pieces. And the natural uh, um, inclination of the society was to move back to its organic forms of association, which were sect and tribe. Sometimes overlapping, often overlapping, but not always. Not always. And locality. And in the case of Iraq, of course, you have not only a sectarian division between Shia and Sunni, but you have an ethnographic distinction between Arabs and Kurds, right? And other small groups, Turkomans, but let's just leave them aside because we don't have time. Boy, do we not, not have time. So the, we smash this state, basically, and then we try to put it together with something called, it's, it's, see, it's another example of how the vocabulary is often misused. We call it nation building. Uh, that really wasn't what we tried to do in Iraq. What, what we were trying to do was state building. We were trying to create a government apparatus that would actually cohere. Uh, we did not succeed. Uh, transferring institutions from one place, one culture to another is very difficult. We haven't figured out how to do, we know how to do it in a couple of cases. We sort of did it in Germany, but that's a Western country. We sort of did it in Japan, but look what we had to do in order to, to set the stage. We had to basically reduce these places to, to rubble, get people on their knees, and then sit, sit on their faces for 50 years. Uh, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine the United States doing that anywhere in the world right now. Uh, we just don't have the patience for that kind of thing, and we certainly don't have the money. Put that, put that aside, all right? So we smash the Iraqi state. It basically splinters into the three um, provinces, three, the three Ottoman provinces, that Percy Cox and Gertrude Bell uh, stuck together in 1920. And uh, uh, that's pretty much where it is right now. Now there's some toing and froing here, and the geopolitics works in to the sectarian cleavages that I spoke about before. Uh, 
These had been building uh, steadily since 1979, a crucial year, all right? Uh, I would love to tell you why 1979, but just, just uh, telegraphically, that of course was the year of the Iranian Revolution, which brings Islam, and in particular Shia Islam, into the picture big time. But that's also the year, uh, because of the, 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 uh, the, the second uh, quadrupling of oil prices, that provides Saudi Arabia with a tremendous amount of revenue, part of which it uses to proselytize the Wahhabi version of Sunni Islam, which before that was a minoritarian uh, trend. Legitimate, un under the tent of Sunni Islam, but a minoritarian um, stream of thinking about Sunni, but thanks to the Saudi money and other, other uh, causes, which I'll, I hope I'll get to in a minute, uh, so the, the balance within the Sunni Islam establishment is now tilted more towards Salafism, more to Wahhabi kinds of thinking, uh, more toward Ibn Tamiya, away from Ibn Rushd, Ibn Ghazala, if you know your Islamic uh, medieval history. I'm sure all of you do. <laughs> um, and, and, and from that time, the, the theological radicalization and revolution within Shiism and Sunnism have been, have been moving toward one another, uh, immovable force and, and, uh, and, and big, big train. Pick your metaphor. You could do better than that, I know. So this has been growing for some time. Um, now, of course, Iran is a Shia country. It wasn't always a Shia country, but thanks to Shah Abbas and the uh, Ottoman Safavi Wars of the 16th century, it became a Shia country. So uh, obviously Iran has a, uh, an interest, both geopolitical, strategic, and religious, in making sure that the uh, Shia government in Baghdad survives and prospers. That's why you're seeing uh, Iranian-supported militia and Iranian troops proper fighting in Iran, in Iraq, uh, and have just taken Tikrit, in, or taken most of Tikrit, which is a Sunni town, uh, in just the last couple of days, right? And there are a lot of people in the United States who are really worried about this. That the Iranians are clearly out, of, you know, they're out mobilizing, sending military forces all over the place, through Hezbollah into Syria, in Lebanon, uh, through, uh, to, through the Houthis in Yemen, and so forth and so on. And this is a concern, all right? Uh, this is quite a concern in, in Washington. Um, but ISIS starts off, you know, part, it really starts off as Al Qaeda in Iraq. You remember Abu Musa al Zarqawi, that, that telegenic fellow? Uh, uh, it starts off because Iraq is shattered. There's no central authority that can govern the Sunni areas up in the northeastern part of the, of the country. And Al-Qaeda uh, Al sets roots down in the vacuum uh, with the rescission of the Iraqi state after the, after the war and the failure of the United States to put enough troops on the ground to prevent it, assuming that would have worked. I don't know. Um, in the short term, it would have worked probably, but how long we felt like keeping you know, 180,000 troops on the ground, another subject. Uh, and so that's how it started. Now, what happens next? Well, uh, what happens next is that we have the Arab Spring. I won't go into the so-called Arab Spring. I won't go into that. Don't have time. But obviously, it creates another failed state in Syria. Uh, it starts with uh, a civil insurrection. It ends up with the regime brutally suppressing uh, uh, not just the rebels, but all the civilian populations, the Sunni populations that support them. Uh, there are four major towns in Syria, uh, Damascus, Homs, Homa, and Aleppo, Aleppo being actually the largest uh, town in Syria. And uh, the regime just pummels all of these support structures for these rebels. The rebels are not united. Uh, Sunnis in Syria have, to my best of my knowledge, have never been united. There's some pretty interesting stories about what that has led to in history, modern history. We don't have time for them, as usual. You know, when I do this stuff, uh, when I teach, it takes me a whole semester. It takes 13 weeks. That's 39 lecture hours and four times that much reading for the students. And I'm trying to do this here in 20 minutes. So forgive me if I, have, if I say we don't have time. So, okay, so what happens in Syria? In Syria, uh, you have a situation where the country begins to polarize. And the longer the civil war goes on, the more radicalized uh, both sides get, but especially the Sunni side. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I've been writing about this in my blog ever since it began, and even before. And you didn't have to be a rocket scientist. All you had to be was like basically sentient and do this for a day job to see that the longer this went on, the more likely it would be that the sides would polarize and that religious symbols and, um, and uh, mobilization devices would be the way that uh, recruitment and retention and, uh, and cohesion would be created in these various groups. So that's what happened, basically, in a nutshell. Uh, you have radical Sunnis in, um, in Syria, and the majority of the population in Syria is Sunni, so it was ruled by, it's ruled by Alawis, a minor, minoritarian group. Alawis are not Shia. People like to say that Alawis and Shia are the same thing. 
This is not true. The Shia in Iran are Jafari or Twelver Shias. There are virtually no Twelver Shias in, um, in Syria. There's some Ismailis. Those are Seveners. Don't, again, we don't have time to explain these things if you don't already know these things. But Alawi Islam is heterodox, and that's good enough uh, for, uh, for Iran in the case that they're, you know, they're, they're trying to uh, uh, discomfit the Sunni world. Uh, and so you have uh, a, growing, uh, a growing civil war. Now, the Obama administration elected early on uh, when it looked like the smart money was that uh, Bashar al-Assad couldn't survive the rebellion. And so what did the president say? He's got to go, right? That looked like an easy bet because it was gonna, he was going to go anyway, it seemed, and we didn't have to do anything to make it happen. That's putting yourself on the so-called right side of history. I hate that term. Anyway, so look, below and behold, it didn't happen. Uh, the Iranians, through Hezbollah and the Russians, came to the Syrian regime's uh, 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 rescue. And pretty soon, after a while, the, tide began, the situation began to stabilize militarily. And then the tide began to turn, and the rebels, because of their dis disunity and other factors, began to be more or less on the defensive. And this war has now gone on for you know, about four years, right? And more than 200,000 people have been killed, mostly innocents, mostly unarmed civilians. It's been horrific. Now, here you are in a region where sectarian conflict is omnipresent in people's minds. By the way, where history is a living memory. Uh, you know, in the United States, when you talk about, uh, you know, we're, we're moving forward again to the second battle of Karbala. Well, the first battle of Karbala took place, if I remember correctly, I was there, of course, on October 10th in the year 610, all right? When you say that kind of thing in the United States, people think you fell out of a tree and hit your head. Anything that happened before 1776 just doesn't exist for most Americans. This is the only society in the world where when we say that's history, we mean that's irrelevant. This is not the way people in the Middle East think. These, these memories, these historical memories are active in their minds, all right? So uh, in, in the case of Syria, what happened? A common cause was made between, uh, well, it was you know, al-Qaeda in Iraq, but it, it moved away from uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, and it became an independent, sort of a renegade, even more radical group than al-Qaeda, if you can imagine. All right? And uh, there was an affinity here, both uh, ideologically, uh, but also an affinity in terms of tribe. If you look at a map of where the Iraqi-Syrian border used to be, uh, there are some very large tribal confederations that spread on both sides of that frontier. And the border, for all practical purposes, isn't there. And Abu Bakr, uh, who succeeded Muhammad, told everybody, Arabs, learn your genealogies. All right? The territorial state is not the way Arabs think of political uh, uh, authority. They think of it in terms of who you're related to. Wherever the, wherever the people that you're related to, in concentric circles out from the core, wherever you move, that's where your state is. It's kind of like a mobile feast, except it's a mobile state, within reason. Okay. Um, so uh, these two groups, now why, why would this happen? Well, here, here, are, here are these massacres, all right, these horrible massacres uh, by the Syrian regime and their Hezbollah um, mercenaries of Sunnis. Again, really, I mean, I don't even want to describe some of the things that were done to civilians because it's just not, it isn't proper before or after dinner uh, in a crowd like this. But now here are these, these, these co-religionists, these Sunnis, and they're looking around, at, they're looking around and saying, why aren't the Arab states, why, why aren't the Sunni Arab states coming to our defense? Why are they letting all these people be slaughtered? Where are the Saudis? Where are the Kuwaitis? Where are the Emiratis? Where are the Qataris? Where are all the Sunni Arabs? Why aren't they doing anything? Okay, well, you look at the Sunni Arab states today, and what you see is uh, a bunch of extremely paranoid, feeble regimes. Uh, the, 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 the paragon of them, of course, is the Al Khalifa family in Bahrain, which again has a Shia majority but a, a ruling Sunni monarchy. And then what about the Americans? Where are the Americans? The Americans come to the rescue, right? It's the Lone Ranger, it's Silver, it's the White Horse. Why don't the Americans come and stop these massacres? They stop them in the Balkans, stop them in Kosovo. Why don't they come and stop the massacre? Well, you know, well, there were a lot of theories about that. But uh, uh, whatever, whatever the theories were, we didn't, we didn't do anything. The administration um, uh, considered the circumstances and decided that it was a bridge too far. It was a slippery slope. And I'm sim I sympathize with, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the concern. I mean, it's very easy to put forces in a place. It's not so easy to get them back out again or to do any good politically uh, once they've been there. I mean, uh, our military is superb at making noise, breaking things, and killing people. All right? It's not so good 
at, at, uh, at as I say, at building institutions and leading a, leading a place better than it was before. And unfortunately, our diplomatic toolkit is a little bereft of non-kinetic ways to do these things. I mean, we even sent the military off to West Africa to fight Ebola. Now, that's a sign of antecedent error. When you've got to send the military to do a thing like that, you have no expeditionary medical corps. Something is the matter with the structure of how you do things, right? But that's a side point. We don't have time for it. OK, so, so the Bush administration, uh, by doing too much too fast in Iraq, shattered the Iraqi state. Uh, the Obama administration, though for, for understandable reasons, was too passive at an early stage in Syria and allowed the Syrian state to dissolve and then to become radicalized. And out of the, vac the, the twin vacuum, you get ISIS or the Islamic State, or Daesh, or again, whatever you want to call it. There's another factor, though, that I, I really think I need to mention here. It's a, it's a deeper factor. Uh, yes, the United States was partly responsible for the, uh, the destruction of the Iraqi state from 1920. Yes, it was partially responsible for the destruction of the Syrian state, dating from, oh, you know, really 1943, not that old. But there's another level of disrupt disruptiveness that I think I, I would like to point out. During the Cold War, the United States thought of itself and its allies thought of the United States as a status quo power. And from a geopolitical, see I get to use the word, from a geopolitical point of view, the United States was a status quo power. We wanted to keep things the way they were. The Soviet Union and its allies, they were the revolutionaries pushing on, uh, pushing on uh, the, the, the liberal, liberal world order that had been created at, under American ages after the Second World War. Uh, and it was, but we weren't a status quo power in terms of uh, culture and economics. Uh, the, the churn of American creativity, the worldwide span of American business activity, uh, the, this, the, the, the juggernaut of change that American society is affected every, just about every nook and cranny of the world. The um, authority structures, the um, patrimonial societies in uh, the third, what we used to call the third world, Middle East, West Africa, other places, uh, were shocked by these changes and are still trying to adjust to them. So part of the explanation for the so-called Arab Spring, aside from food prices going up because of this ethanol fraud, but that's another story. I haven't got time for that either. Um, part of the reasons for this is just the, the swamping of the entire, the, sort of the colonization of the entire world by American, by American uh, uh, corporate and cultural energies. Undermine, created, well, you know, we call them generation gaps, right? Created generation gaps in a lot of these countries. People stopped respecting their elders. Uh, and when that happens in a, pa a patrimonial society, all hell can break loose. And you see this uh, very vividly in, uh, in, in, in the context of the so-called Arab Spring. For example, in Egypt, when the Egyptians had an election, of course, they elected Mohamed Morsi. That was too bad. That didn't last too long. But what you saw, what you saw was something quite remarkable. In, outside of Cairo and Alexandria and Luxor and the larger cities in Egypt, the way it used to go was uh, the, the, uh, the, the patriarch, the elder tribal figure, the sheikh, uh, whatever, would tell everybody how to vote. Not that these elections were really that open and free anyhow. They were kind of like ratification processes of the military bureaucracy in Egypt. But what you saw in the most recent election was that people didn't do that. Young people said, you can't tell me who to vote for. I'm going to vote for who I want to vote for. Women were saying, I'm going to vote for who I want to vote for. I'm not going to vote for who my father, or my uncle, or my grandfather tell. That's revolutionary in Egypt, Egyptian society. Why is that? Because there are American TV shows, and there are American movies, and there are European shows, and it's all flooding through with all of the um, new technologies and uh, you know, the, um, the internet and the, the social networking. All this stuff is coming through to younger generations throughout the Arab world and throughout the rest of the Middle East. And it's making a difference. This is making changes in the culture at the same time that the international economy is creating changes in the social structure. Again, to go back to anthropology, anthropologists distinguish between social, stru social structure and culture. They're related, of course, but they aren't the same. Don't have time to talk about that either. So here we are, the United States, uh, by doing too much and, uh, and, and in, too fast in uh, Iraq, and then by doing too little or not too late in, in Syria, essentially you have created uh, at least the potential for ISIS, and don't forget, ISIS is not a strong organization. Uh, in the beginning, when it, when it took Mosul in June, uh, and shortly thereafter, it had uh, a uh, um, uh, order of battle of something like, there were estimates that were wildly all, all over the place, but the estimates of something like, like 30,000 soldiers. 
And these are 30,000 soldiers with no air force, with no APCs, no artillery, no tanks, pretty much no nothing. There was stuff that they, they got uh, in Mosul and some money they got, and there were some old members of the Iraqi uh, military, the Baath, that was able to figure out how to use some of this stuff, although the old Iraqi order of battle was Soviet, not American. Um, but basically, this was a rather underarmed group of, of, of young guys. And of course, some foreigners um, came in. Estimates anywhere between five and 8,000 foreigners have come into um, what is the territory of um, uh, Daesh, or the Islamic uh, Caliphate, which, by the way, is not small by one measure. Uh, again, geopolitics. Uh, the, the territory that Daesh controls is larger than the United Kingdom, if that, if that helps you. It probably doesn't, because they don't control it all very well. The point I'm trying to make here is that Daesh is a very under-institutionalized organization, but it is pushing on an open door because the level of institutionalization in the countries that it is operating in is even, is even lower. So we're talking about very relatively inept military forces, relati relatively, well, modest is a nice word, capacity for, real, for governance in these places. So everything's relative, right? And we're talking about highly, highly um, uh, under-institutionalized kinds of organizations. And they are prone to uh, heterodoxy. With, heterodoxy is always prone to further splits. So they split within each other. Uh, and it's also important to understand, you know, I, I had a lot of trouble. I, I didn't get all that excited about ISIS at first. I mean, Secretary, the former Secretary of Defense, Hegel, uh, made a comment that this was like the biggest threat to American interests in the world, and that uh, they threatened everything, and that they're terrorists. And da -da -da -da. I, I'm sorry, I had a lot of difficulty with that, because it was clear to me that uh, ISIS was a very ungainly coalition. You had a couple of, you know, fanatical, chiliastic true believers. Uh, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, certainly one of them. He's certainly not alone. There's a core of, you know, Salafi uh, extremists there, no question about it. But there are also opportunists, um, people trying to make uh, a buck when they got some money from oil and to, from robbing banks in Mosul. Uh, you, they could finally, they could, it's, you know, it's a rent a crowd, rent, a, rent an army kind of a part of the world in some respects. They were promising people a lot of money. And if they would go from Syria to Iraq or from Iraq to Syria as the case, they were promising them a lot of stuff that they couldn't get otherwise. And I just want to show you, in the current issue of the magazine, which looks like this, even though the cover has this Chinese guy on it, uh, the, uh, the lead, you know, when you get older, your fingers don't have any juice anymore. You can't turn pages. Uh, my friend Rasha Alakidi, who's from Mosul, and I, I titled this for her, Caliphatalism. So that's what editors get to do. Ed editors get to have great fun with titles. Anyway, uh, she basically has an ear on what's going on in Mosul. Her parents are still there. Her siblings are still there. And what she, what she tells you in, in, this, in this fantastic essay is that a lot of what happened around Mosul was simply people uh, of a lower socioeconomic echelon in the countryside getting revenge against the snooty types who lived in Mosul, against the urbanites. This had nothing whatsoever to do with ideology or theology or religion. This just had to do with social envy and revenge. Now, another part of the coalition, uh, the initial coalition of, of ISIS, um, was um, made up of essentially tribal confederacies. You know, the, 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 here's, here's like the al, al Wadanis, and various tribes that straddle the border. So here they are. There's ISIS over there, okay? And they are, they are crazy people, okay? And they are coming at you in uh, Toyota trucks with machine guns on the back, and they are pulling over cars, and they are shooting people in the face 10 times, and they're having a ball because no one's shooting back, okay? And on the other side, all right, there are these Shiites. Uh, there's the Maliki types, these Shiites with the Iranian backing and these Iranian goon squads, uh, um, financed goon squads, they're on, so what do you do, okay? Uh, you, you, you've, made, you've tried to make your peace several times with a Shia government in Baghdad. It had to work out too well. But here are these lunatics coming from the other, what do you do, okay? So a lot of this was simply, um, how shall we say, adult conversations between uh, ISIS types and some of these tribal, tribal leaders. You know, you leave us alone, we'll help you here, uh, th these are deals people make. Are these, are these tribal uh, sheikhs and their followers and these families, are they Salafis? Are they uh, religious fanatics? No. No, they couldn't care less. So I, I wrote this on my blog back in June. I said, this is a very fragile coalition. As long as it's winning, uh, you know, strong horse kind of stuff, as long as it's winning, uh, it'll attract recruits. Uh, it'll attract attention. It may even attract fealty from far away. 
But it's bound to fall apart. Uh, very extreme uh, uh, groups like this never persist. They collapse. Now, it's not too, I mean, there, there are examples in history of where you know, fanatical lunatics actually can create some semblance of governance. The best example, actually, and the one that I thought of immediately when I got wind of what, what the ISIS was doing, was the Almohad invasion of Almoravid Spain in the 12th century. Now, again, I think like this because I, I like history. But you say this kind of thing in Philadelphia, God, in Washington, and you know, people just run out of the room screaming, Almohad, Almoravid, what are you talking about? So, but if some of you know this stuff, so you get the point. The, Al the Almohads were Berber lunatics who just came in and, and just trashed Cordoba, which was, uh, at that time, uh, uh, a beacon of tolerance and civilization and uh, coexistence between Muslims and Christians and Jews and so on. Well, you know, that's the way, that's the way it goes. So that's what I, th when I saw ISIS, that's what I thought of. And I also thought of uh, uh, that this was a revitalization movement, as the anthropologist uh, Anthony Wallace wrote about back in 1956. And Professor Klausner will know this. Uh, uh, and in, in, but in Washington, of course, this was not a revitalization movement. And when the president talked about this in September, he said explicitly, this is not a state. ISIS is not a state because no other state recognizes it as a state. And I thought to myself, yeah, he needs to go back to graduate school and, and go to and take some social stuff. Yes, it is. It's, it is a state building. It started out as a state building project. A pre-modern one, yes. Uh, was it a prophetic, apocalyptic, millenarian, chiliastic one? Some, in some respects, yes. All right. Was it a terrorist organization? What terrorist organization do you know of that tries to secure and hold state-scale territory? Can you think of one? I can't. All right. Now, they, ISIS certainly used terrorist tactics, but so does everybody. Uh, Hakarat uh, Hazm, our, our guys, our so-called moderate guys in Syria, which no longer exists because it was destroyed by uh, al-Nusra, Jabhat al-Nusra, they also use uh, very nasty tactics and kill civilians whenever they, they think it's to their... Everybody does that. It's a tactic, right? But we have come in this country in the last couple of years to, in our, in our Manichaean brains, to boil everything down to uh, this terrorism filter. Terrorism, terrorist means bad guys. Anybody else means not so bad guys. Possibly good guys, not really. Just not so bad. We use this filter to distinguish and decide who was on our side or might be on our side or might not be on not their side. It's, it, it doesn't work. This is, this, is, uh, this is a category error. This is language wrongly applied. All right? ISIS was and remains a state-building enterprise, except it can't govern, for reasons I, I mentioned. It can't keep its coalition together. Uh, and uh, as soon as it starts to lose territory, which it, it lost in Kobani, uh, thanks to the Peshmerga, and which it's losing now in some of the Sunni areas of Iraq, thanks to uh, the Iraqi army and the Iranians who are helping them, then the sheen very quickly fades away. And all the European recruits and all the other recruits will want to leave. And some of them have tried to leave, and you know what? They've been shot for trying to leave. So this, this is a meteoric and I think uh, will be a relatively quick-lived phenomenon. It won't go away. It won't disappear. And there's still two very difficult um, operations to be conducted in order to finally put pay to them. And it's going to take boots on the ground to do it. All right? One is Raqqa, and the other, even more formidable, is Mosul. Now, taking these two towns, a serious military force can take these towns. Uh, Raqqa, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the ISIS recruits uh, sort of melted into the population. They're not wearing uniforms. You can't tell who they are. right? So they're not a regular army by any stretch of the imagination. So it's not easy to root them out, but you've got a lot of help there, all right? You've got a lot of Sunnis now in Raqqa who are damn tired of these, these crazy people, you know, smashing antiquities and, and, and raping Yazidi women and doing all kinds of things that a good Muslim obviously would never do, all right? Now, Mosul is even more difficult because there are Kurds nearby, there are Turkmans and so forth. The real problem is not, is not uh, ridding uh, Mosul of, of uh, Daesh troops. The real problem is what do you do once you've done that? All right. In the beginning, as, as Russia explains, you know, the, when, they, when, the, when the ISIS types came to Mosul, they didn't say, we're ISIS. We're the guys who tromped on, in Fallujah and Ramadi a year, in, in, in six months before Mosul fell. All right. They were already on my radar. All right. um, they didn't say they were ISIS. They just said they were, they were Sunni rebels fighting against the wicked, Maliki, Iranian-inspired government in Baghdad. 
And so they were welcome, not welcome, but they were, they were certainly tolerated. It was only a couple of weeks later when they started you know, issuing these fatwas and edicts that you know, made them look like they were rushing madly from the 7th century into the 8th century. And the Sunni aristocracy in Mosul said, whoa, wait a minute. These aren't friends. These people are nuts. These people are combination platters missing a taco. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of very bad blood uh, against ISIS in Mosul. So there will be people who will fight them if they're able, if they can get, if you can get wet. But that's not the problem. The problem is what happens when ISIS is destroyed in these towns? How do you create a government? Do you think people in Mosul want uh, the Shia government in Baghdad back to rule them? I don't think so. Uh, what this actually means is that this is a, the disruption is a long-term problem. It will take many, it will, it will take on many faces as time goes on. But here, here, the American policy is based on an assumption. It's based on a Westphalian assumption. And that is, once ISIS is destroyed in Iraq, there can be a political solution to Iraq's divisions, and there will once again be a territorial state called Iraq in the borders we, we knew it, we knew it uh, uh, as before March 2003, and in Syria, once there is some kind of resolution to the Syrian civil war, and Bashar al-Assad, one way or another, is shown the way out, shown the door in Damascus, then we will have a Syrian state that, again, looks more or less like it looked uh, between 1943 and March of 2011. Sorry, folks. These states are gone. They are gone, and they are not coming back. What does that mean in terms of geopolitics and in terms of American policy? It means two things. First of all, uh, ISIS has been very telegenic. They cut off people's heads who get caught in the wrong place. But they are not as much of a threat uh, geopolitically as Iran is, as an Iranian nuclear weapon is. As uh, Iran is a state that does control most of its own territory. We, can, we could do something about that with its Kurds and its Azeris if we wanted to, but we don't yet much want to. Um, Iran is a state. It, it coheres. And therefore, in the face of all these other states that are, that are falling or, or have crumbled, uh, um, it looks pretty formidable. From a geostrategic point of view, Iran is a much more dangerous country than um, Daesh or I ISIS. It's just not as telegenic, because it's not as stupid. It's not as fanatical, at least, at least not in public. Uh, but the second thing that it means is uh, the state structures that created the, the modern Middle East, that is the post-World War I Middle East, are that it's not coming back. So what will happen to these places and these people and this territory? This is another lecture, which we don't have time for. But uh, uh, let me just mention to you that uh, between roughly the rescission of the Mongol armies from this area in the beginning of the 1300s until the arrival of Suleiman, the magnificent, the Ottomans in about 15, 1522, I think it was, 1517, somewhere. For a couple of hundred years, this was basically a, 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 a place where there was utter chaos. Uh, some of the larger cities had local government, but out in the hinterlands, it was, it was uh, you, either, you paid your tolls, your extortion rates, to raiding tribes. It, it was basically an, an ungoverned, ungoverned zone, a gray zone. And it's a place where terrorists and other <coughs> ne'er-do-wells and narco-criminals, and you name it, can make hay. Uh, and so that is the kind of Levant, anyway, that we may be looking at, not to speak of Yemen and Libya, which are in similar circumstances, if not worse. So we are looking ahead toward a, um, a kind of a two or three speed world, a place where there are states and they cohere, a, states, a, a, a group of states that are in trouble, but they are holding together, and a place where the states are simply not holding together. And I wish I had time to explain why, but I don't. My phone is ringing. So, as far as, so again, geopolitics is very important, and we have touched on some of it, but what's going on in the Middle East right now is deeper than geopolitics. It goes right down to the social structures and the, author and the, and the social authority structures of these societies. All right. What will come next? Yeah, I don't know. All I know is that tomorrow it will no longer be St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, Adam. Uh, there was a lot of stuff in that there. <laughs> stuff. Uh, we're, we're open for our questions. Uh, Eli, uh, wait till Eli comes to you with the microphone and direct your question directly into the microphone. Steve uh, Hilkowitz. Based on what I'm understanding you're saying, and maybe I'm wrong, but my understanding is we should actually be supporting ISIS against because they are the they are the Sunnis. All of our allies in the Middle East, if there are any, are Sunnis, 
and all our enemies are Shias. You win a free magazine. <laughs> Anybody who asks a good question wins a free magazine. Uh, what you say is very logical, and some people believe that, but I don't. Uh, you know, you don't have to choose between one bad guy and another bad guy. Let me tell you a story, all right? A short, a short story. Right now, the West, the United States, leading what goes under the name of the West, whatever you want to think of it as, is looking at a, sectarian, a major sectarian cleavage in the Middle East and is wondering what to do about it. And some people say, well, we should support one side or the other as the lesser evil. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the logic you just, you just rolled out suggests, well, you know, the Iranians are more dangerous. They have a state structure. They may get a nuclear weapon. Therefore, we should... Okay, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is a kind of a form of offshore balancing geopolitics. You support the side that's losing. You keep them fighting as long as possible until, you wear, until they wear each other down, and they're so angry at each other that they forget about you. All right? That's appealing to some, to some but it's appealing in a very superficial way. Because the longer this goes on, the more radicalized the populations and the fighters get. Uh, the more one generation, another generation, a third generation is lost, essentially. And the more uh, dislocation and chaos uh, will spread uh, to uh, other countries and other, other societies. So that's not a very attractive option either. But 500 years ago, again, I loved it. 500 years ago, the shoe was on the other foot. What do I mean? There was a Muslim great power, a Muslim superpower. It's called the Ottoman Empire. And it looked over, and what did it see? In 1517, Martin Luther nails his piece of paper to the church door in Wittenberg. And before very long, you have a major sectarian cleavage within Christendom. How does the Ottoman, and the Ottoman Empire is part of the international system of, of the day, right? How does the Ottoman Empire play? How does it navigate the wars of the Reformation? Well, it's an interesting question. There were four Muslim uh, uh, sultans during that epoch, 100 years really. In the beginning, of course, the wars of the Reformation were not state-centric. There was the Peasants' Revolt, which was a Chileastic uprising. Remember, you know, Thomas Munzer and those people. I hope you know, have heard of these people. I don't know. Uh, there, was, there was a Chileastic uh, uh, uprising in what is today Germany in the 1600s. Uh, um, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and Thomas Munzer have a lot in common. All right? They have a lot in common with the zealots of first century uh, 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 Jewish Palestine. They have a lot in common with the crusaders that savaged Jerusalem in 1099. They have a lot in common even with the American Indians who ghost danced after the Civil War. This is what Chileastic violence um, uh, is. Uh, it, it, uh, it's not just Middle Eastern. It's not just Muslim. It's not just Arab. Uh, every, there's, every major civilization has experienced this kind of problem whenever there has been great upheaval, and religious symbols are always employed uh, to wage these kinds, of, these kinds of fights. Some people say it's irrational. Well, you know, uh, uh, what's irrational to some people depends on the circumstances, doesn't it? So, uh, it's, it's not an either-or, chocolate, vanilla, cowboy, Indian kind of problem. We don't really have to support either side. Uh, we don't actually have a dog in that fight, to quote James, James Baker, when he talked about the, the Balkans years ago. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. It seems to me that what you have to do is not make very broad generalizations or jump to conclusions, but to look at each circumstance in each case uh, for, what it, for what it holds. It doesn't mean you can't, shouldn't think, think strategically. You need to do that. Okay? You need to try to get your arms around the whole situation. But this is extraordinarily complex. It's going to take many decades, decades, to play out. All right? So we should be very deliberate and very patient. And in this sense, I, I, have nothing but, but I want to give nothing but credit to President Obama, who counsels strategic patience. And that's the right thing to do, be doing in this, in, this, in this particular case. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that you don't do anything. I mean, they like to tout you know, leading from behind. Well, leading from behind is good work if you can get it. But leading from behind isn't the same as sitting on your behind which is what they did in Syria, right? So, no, it's not an either-or proposition. You know, it, would be, it would be so simple if it were, but it's not. Next question. Nelson Wolf. Church will have this statement oh, that's the wrong that, the op, that the optimist looked at every difficulty as an opportunity and the peasant looked at every opportunity as a difficulty. This looks like a very good opportunity for Iran, and Iran has already jumped the fence by supporting Sunni groups, so she agrees, like she Hamas. Agrees, she agrees, so yeah. the question I would like to ask you is, uh, uh, 
what's Iran's role in this thing? And is Iran really fighting ISIS, or is this a ballet? Okay, uh, Iran no longer uh, supports Hamas. They are really on the outs with one another, and that's hurt Hamas uh, a lot. And one of the reasons Hamas started a war uh, not that many months ago was because it, it was broke and it had to attract funds. And the way a group like that attracts funds is that it kills Israelis. Right? So they're not supporting Hamas anymore. Hamas is a Sunni group. Um, a lot, as I said before in my talk, a lot of people are worried now seeing Al-Quds brigade types you know, on, the, on the outskirts of Tikrit. And they look around, they see um, Iranian machinations in Yemen with the Houthis. Uh, not exactly a typical Shia group, but nevertheless close enough for government work. You know? uh, they see the Iranians with Hezbollah in Syria. They see the weapons, so on and so forth. Again, I don't, I don't, um, I don't belittle this. It's not something that uh, you want to ignore or make a joke about. But the Iranians are not 10 cubits tall. There are antibodies in the Arab Sunni world against Iranian influence. So there are inroads that Iran is making right now in, in several Arab countries. Um, uh, but there are inroads that other um, governments with money are making too, like Qataris, the Qataris. The Qataris and, and the UAE, which is right next, they're on opposite sides of the civil war in, in Libya. I mean, the UAE has even bombed Qatari clients using Egyptian airfields. I mean, what we're seeing in the Arab world right now is really unprecedented. I mean, you haven't seen Arab countries use military force against each other since the Yemeni civil war where Egyptian and Saudi troops fought, fought in Yemen in 1962, 63. It's been a long time, so we're really in a different ballgame here. Of course, one of the reasons for that is that the United States' grand strategy is really, we're in the, the security competition suppression business, right? That's what our grand strategy has been about, first in Europe, then in East Asia, and then laterally, instrumentally, in the Middle East. When the United States is not there, and we don't suppress security competitions, guess what? They don't get suppressed, and people go kinetic, and that's what's happening now, and that can get dangerous, okay? Uh, uh, countries that feel like their protector, and superpowers are in the protection game, basically. Uh, their protector is like uh, gone on a Viennese lunch break, let's put it that way. They do one of two things. They either genuflect to the power that, uh, that can hurt them, or they engage in sometimes very dangerous forms of self-help. One of the very dangerous forms of self-help that the Iranians are causing, all right, uh, by what they're doing and, and our, relative, our, our strategic patience, our lack of, our lack of uh, engagement, uh, is that uh, there's a long-standing uh, understanding between um, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan that if the Iranians get nuclear weapons or, somebody, or the Turks or somebody else gets nuclear weapons, uh, Pakistan already has nuclear weapons, right? And the Saudis can rent them and rent Pakistani crews to, to shoot them at people, or at least to deter other people from shooting them at Saudi Arabia. The last thing anybody in their right mind should want should be the insertion of Pakistani military power, nuclear weapons, into the heart of the Middle East. But that's the kind of stuff that happens when uh, the big boy on the block is not spanking, uh, you know, spanking its clients and trying to basically keep everybody from having a laundry problem. You know what I mean? Um, the Iranians uh, will find themselves, at a certain point, highly unwelcome in Sunni uh, populated areas. I'm even hoping that, I mean, I talked to Paul Kennedy the other day, he made me think of this. I'm even hoping that the Iranians will overextend themselves and bring, the, bring, bring their regime down from overextension. It's happened many times in history. I mean, some of the, some of the mullahs, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei being one of them, but, but maybe his successor, who according to the recent um, discussions might be even more radical and you know, messianic minded than he is, um, they may, he, may, he may think that he's bringing on the Messiah, you know, the end of days, you know, the Mahdi, uh, the occluded imam is coming back and history will end and all. I don't know if they really believe this stuff or not, but stranger things have happened. I mean, Christians a couple of centuries ago believed that more, right? Uh, uh, if that's what they think, and they're, and they're not thinking strategically, but they're thinking chiliastically, they could easily overextend themselves and trash their entire regime, and wouldn't that be wonderful, all right? That wouldn't solve the problem, wouldn't solve all the problems, but it would help. It would really help. So uh, do I lose sleep over Iran? I lose sleep over um, a lot of things because I'm to that age, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm to that age, right, just to be more, I'm to that age where, where uh, as a friend of mine used to, has put it, um, I'm too young for Medicare, but I'm too old for women to care. <laughs> right? So I lose sleep, I'm going to get insomnia. You know? So when, when, I, when I'm awake at night, worrying about, do I, work, do I worry about the Iranians? Do I worry about an Iranian nuclear weapon? No. Do I worry about ISIS? No. The only existential threats to the United States are the things that we're doing to ourselves right now. That I worry about. I have two grandchildren now, right? Talk. Two grandchildren. 
That's why I worry about it. I worry about things that are going on here. If uh, the United States had not invaded Iraq in 2003. Who's talking? Oh, oh. could you pass that magazine back? Like Everybody, that magazine. you're picking on people in the back of the room. I got to walk all the way back there. <laughs> Go ahead, sir, please. If the United States had not invaded Iraq in 2003 and left Saddam as a bulwark against Iran, would we not be better off? And I say we, I mean the Western world. Well, you know, that's a counterfactual. Uh, and counterfactual history is loads of fun, but ultimately inconclusive, you know. Uh, at the time, uh, let me put it to you this way. I don't want to refight the Iraq War. We don't have time. <laughs> there was a national security case for invading Iraq and getting rid of Saddam. But to say there was a national security case doesn't mean it was the only consideration. Right? When you start a war, you've got to think about not just you know, uh, stage one, stage two of how you deal with an enemy kinetically, but how this is going to end up politically and otherwise, and geopolitically. All right? This was not thought through very well, to put it mildly. Okay? There was a plan, all right? and had the plan worked exactly as, as sketched out by the Defense Department, well, you know, things might have gone pretty, you know, pretty hunky-dunky. But there was no plan B in case plan A didn't pan out. All right? And another FPRI alumnus, a guy with whom I shared an office uh, at a different, a different uh, site back in 1972, still friend of mine, Douglas Fife. I said, Doug, where the hell was plan B? He said, Adam, you know, plan A wasn't even that, that tightly wrapped. There was no plan B. But the Defense Department never wanted to occupy Iraq. This was, this was the great irony of that war. Nobody in the US government, not the White House, not the State Department, not the CIA, not the defense, nobody wanted to occupy Iraq, because we knew what would happen. There would be an intifada, Iraqi-style intifada. Everybody knew that. So the great irony, you know how you can prove that, that nobody wanted to uh, occupy Iraq? Nobody budgeted for it. It was around the time of the year where people were putting in their supplementals and their budgets, right? If anybody had really wanted to occupy Iraq, they would have budgeted. Nobody budgeted for it. That's proof in Washington, because a budget is the most political document in the city. And so the irony of the thing is we ended up doing it anyway. All right? Now, there were lots of reasons, different kinds of reasons why people wanted to, wanted to do this. I was, ambi I was ambivalent about it. I wanted to know where the, how the movie ended. I wasn't interested only in the way in. I wanted to know what the way out was going to be. And nobody could tell me that. So, you know, I, I kind of like, you know, I didn't really know what to do. In retrospect, sure. The idea was, okay, we, we, we've got American forces in Afghanistan on one side of Iran. If we, uh, if we occupy Iraq, we've got American forces on another side uh, of Iran. That kind of pressure could, um, could resolve a lot of problems. We could make them say uncle. We could do, and, and by the way, right after the, uh, the successful toppling of the Ba'ath government, there were uh, messages from the Iranians via a couple of intermediaries basically saying, you know, okay, okay, let's talk, you know, let's cooperate on Afghanistan. And uh, we basically told them to go to hell. We thought that we had them in, in an anvil. We thought that we could get more concessions out of them. But of course, that depended on the uprising not, not happening. And it, depending, it depended on, you know, um, what was the sign on that ship that the President, President Bush stood on? Mission, it, 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 yeah, thank you. It depended on that actually being true, which of course it, it wasn't. So counterfactuals are fun. I don't know. Certainly, uh, the idea that if you get real up nice, close, and, and cozy with the Iranians with military forces on two sides of them, they'll be a little bit more, uh, a little bit better behaved. Geostrategically, that's not foolish. But if it goes wrong, ah, then what happens? Then what happens is um, they do whatever they want. Uh, we have trouble stopping them for a variety of reasons. And look where the Fifth Fleet is, is based. It's based in Bahrain. Look where al Oded Air Force Base is. It's in Qatar. There are lots of American sailors and soldiers within range of Iranian missiles if we, if we end up getting into a fight with the Iranians, which I personally think is probable. Because arms control, arms control deals, even if they work, don't change reality. They simply modulate its timing and shape, okay? even if they work. So uh, we might, at some point, get into a fight with the Iranians. And it might be as, as terrible an option as it is. It might be the least bad of, of the options. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that either. But I wish those guys weren't there. They're sitting ducks. They're soft targets for Iranian missiles. If we won, if things had gone right in Iraq, right, that had been, been a force push against the Iranians. But the fact that things didn't turn out that way 
reverses the situation and makes them, makes them essentially liabilities as far as we're concerned. Personally, I would get, I would get our, 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 our sweet military asses out of those places. We have time for one last question. But I got, but I got no, but I got three more magazines. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's got the question? OK, sir, please. Since we've seen there are so many places where a non-coincident state and nation seem to be the source of the problem, and we look at Yugoslavia, which essentially resolved into one where we devolved in, into nation states, why are we so resistant to, say, the breakup of Iraq? I mean, when Biden suggested it, you know, people said foot and mouth again. But yeah. it seems to be that that's the solution to a lot of these problems. Well, you know, uh, th th in, in the scholarly world, this whole business has been partitioned and so it's been studied a fair bit. And uh, uh, some, pretty, some pretty, you know, serious political scientists and international relations types have, like, basically run the gamut and tried to figure out under which circumstances did partition end up with a reasonably benign outcome and in which circumstances did it not. And it's a, like in most political science studies, it's a mixed bag, right? Uh, it doesn't always work out so hot in the longer run. I mean, you know, look, take a look at, at, uh, at the former Yugoslavia. Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, Ljubljana's doing all right. Slovenians are doing all right. Tiny little country. Cro Croatia, well, let me talk about, but the, where, the, where the war was, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Ser Republic Srpska. Uh, those places are basically frozen. Uh, the Dayton Accords kind of froze them. But they haven't made a lot of progress, really, toward uh, cohabitation or tolerance. The war clarified some of the mixed-up boundaries so that you have more homogeneous places than you used to. But that problem's not solved. It's just frozen. My feeling is that at some point, uh, it'll melt uh, at a very uh, unpropitious time, no doubt. That's just the way life is. So th that partition didn't solve anything. Um, India-Pakistan, don't get me started. What did that solve? What a, what a disaster. Um, so, yeah, sometimes it does. Now, in the case of Iraq, in the case of Iraq, um, it, is, it is de facto partitioned right now. And as I say, it's not going to come back together again. I have argued for some time now that it is, it is in American interest, as long as it can be coord coordinated properly, and this takes, this takes retail diplomacy and serious effort, as long as it can be coordinated with the Turks, who are not the ally they once were. They're a different bag of petunias now, if you'll excuse a mixed metaphor. An independent Kurdistan based on the Kurdish regional government in North, what used to be northern Iraq is a good idea. The Kurds like us. I don't know why, <laughs> uh, given our track record. They like us. They're basically, they got a going concern up there. They're doing well. Uh, they're what I call proto-democratic. Not that their history has a lot of hope for uh, liberal institutions, but you know, they could certainly accomplish it, I think, in a relatively decent amount of time if they want. Uh, I believe in um, uh, uh, an independent Kurdistan would be a good idea. Again, as long as it can be arranged without breaking too much crockery, which takes a lot of care. So what, what, is, the, what, is, the, what is the Bush administration, wait a minute, the Bush, what does the Obama administration do when ISIS erupts and so forth and they have a difficulty? The first country they go to speak with about this, right, is they send my old friend Jeffrey Feltman, Ambassador Feltman, to Tehran, right? The first place they should have sent somebody was to Ankara. So this is an administration that likes to engage and stretch out its hands to its adversaries. But as far as its friends are concerned, what, who, who are they? What's their name? Where are they? You know? um, so that, I th there's just a lot of things, a lot of uh, what I would call sort of small, you know, small and mid-range decisions that, that have given me um, a kind of a not great feeling about the professionalism and the strategic depth of the way the administration thinks and handles these things. They, they do a lot of crisis management, which is inevitable. It's just the way the world is, especially these days. And they have intuitions and ideas. They have a lot of ideas, right? But when it comes to actually putting them all together and, 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 and where the rubber meets the road in reality, they struggle a little bit. They, t they treat every, every, uh, every volcanic eruption as a one-off. They don't integrate very well, it seems to me. So for a while, you know, um, uh, there was the accusation, I think, reasonable, that we were trying to get in bed with the Iranians. We were trying to bring them in from the cold the same way Nixon brought in China from the cold. And we wouldn't do anything in Syria because we didn't want to hurt the, the Assad regime because that would make the Iranians less likely to negotiate on their nuclear portfolio, whereas, of course, the opposite was true. If you get tough in the neighborhood, that gives them incentive to actually take you seriously. So that was totally screwed up. Again, adversary friend. You know. um, and so uh, they were accused of you know, basically wanting to get in bed with the Iranians. And certainly, whether that was true or not, the Saudis certainly believed it, believe it. They would still believe it. You know, the Saudis have a phrase for the Iranians. You know, they, 
uh, the ambassador, uh, Turkey, al Faisal, we want to cut off the head of the snake, right? What are the Americans doing? The Americans are negotiating with the snake. The Americans are taking the snake out to lunch in Geneva, right? We want to cut off, you know, honestly, so they believe it, even if it's not true. So now, just in the last couple of days, what the administration, the White House spokesman says, well, yeah, Iran's a threat. Look at what they're doing. This is the first uh, language like that we've heard in quite a while, right? Uh, the administration, there was a fellow named uh, Manning, a British, British uh, academic named Charles Manning, who said this most wonderful thing years ago. He said, you do not affect the position of a shadow by doing things to the shadow. So here we are bombing ISIS. Here we are bombing ISIS, all right, uh, with some help, no boots on the ground. We're bombing ISIS. But the cause of ISIS is the destruction of the Iraqi state, but in particular, the butchery of 200,000 Sunnis in Syria by the Syrian regime. Now, we're not saying anymore, you know, except that, we, that our number one priority is, is ending the Syrian civil war by getting rid of this butcher in Damascus. And, and the only country with boots on the ground that would actually use the boots on the ground to solve this problem in Syria is Turkey. And why won't the Turks do it? Because the Turks understand that the source of the problem is in Syria. And ISIS is just a shadow. The Turks don't want to touch, do things to the shadow. They want to do things to the source of the shadow. And we don't get it. All right? So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adam. Uh, I think you clarified a lot of what is in that cloud you were talking about at the beginning of your talk. There was, however, a lot of things you didn't have time to talk about, so there's only one solution. We'll have to have you back here in Philadelphia. Thank you all very much.